Good afternoon all. Welcome to the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce webinar. I'm pleased to introduce, we have Martin Tett, leader of the newly formed Buckinghamshire County Council, or council in fact. Um, that's me, your host. I am Sonny, account manager at Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. My contact details will be below on the screen if you need to get on contact with me. Our host today is Martin, as I mentioned, leader of Buck News from the Unity Authority of Buckinghamshire County Council. Uh, Martin will be talking about the newly formed Unity Authority, uh, the benefits it brings to both residents and business, among other things. Um, over to you, Martin. Are you still on mute? Hi, let me just unmute myself. Good afternoon. Thanks very much for the welcome. And it's great to be talking to you. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the journey we've had as a council from what were effectively five different councils merging into one new one. Um, and that happened at a fairly traumatic time, quite frankly, because it coincided pretty well exactly with the, uh, the origin and uh, intensity of the COVID crisis and, and how we've had to adapt during that period and some of the pros and cons of being created at that sort of traumatic time. Um, and then I'm going to try and focus on the specifics of how we've been helping the business community. And obviously one of the things I'm very open to is questions about that particular support we've been given. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can have a good debate around this. So uh, it's great to be doing this. Something I was just reflecting on actually when I was putting these slides together is I think it was probably about two years, 18 months ago, maybe two years ago, um, I came to a hotel um, actually in your patch to do uh, a pitch about the whole move to Unitary. Um, and at that time, obviously, it was still quite controversial. Um, and I remember having a really good exchange with everybody there. So it's, it's great to be back with you, quite frankly. And so, again, thanks very much for the invite. So hopefully uh, the screen will work and change as I press the buttons. Let's just make sure it does. There we go. Oops. No. So let me just try and go down to that one. And I need to go on to full screen. I'm not quite sure how to do that. But hey. Um, if anyone can get me back onto full screen, that would be great. If not, let me just move down anyway. Tell how experienced I am at doing this. There we go. That should work pretty well. So just in terms of the journey we've been on and some of the history of this, um, hopefully you'll remember back that uh, back in 2016, actually, um, we put in a request and a business case to move towards a unitary council for the whole of Buckinghamshire. Um, my view has always been that, quite frankly, we had just, quite frankly, overlap duplication between uh, the county council, the district councils, real confusion about who does what, um, quite frankly, you know, lacking economies and scale. And the number of times I talked to people who just simply said, but, but who does this? You know, who do I talk to about this? Sometimes it was the wrong person they were talking to. Sometimes, quite frankly, it was the fact that it, it was a job that was split between two different tiers of government. So we put in a business case back in 2016. Um, and then in March 2018, uh, the Secretary of State, who was then Sajid Javid, uh, announced uh, that he was minded to um, accept that particular business case. Uh, and then in November 2018, we had the then Secretary of State, James Brokenshire, announced that effectively having considered all the representations he'd received uh, he was going to go forward with establishing the new single unitary district council as they called it for Buckinghamshire um, and that's something um, that really I think was a very significant moment in time now as a result of that uh, we actually had to make that work um, and we've had a whole uh, effective period of about a year uh, to pull everything together um, so we've had to establish effectively a sort of shadow executive to make that actually come together, drawing upon the experience of not just the county council, but also representatives from the leadership of all of the district councils as well. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, some of the benefits of the new council, particularly how it relevant, it's relevant to the business community. Uh, first of all, it's a single point of contact. So it goes back to my point about who does what. Um, I think on the whole economic development side, there's been a little bit of confusion at times between who does what, um, you know, who's looking after town centres. Uh, we have experience in Aylesbury, for example, that you know, there was a little bit that the district council did, a little bit that the county council did, um, different patches of land and ownership of different buildings. Bringing it all together makes it much, much simpler. 
so as a single point of contact for the business community into the business support and economic, economic development function now across the, across the entire county geography. Hopefully we can improve the services as well by integrating them together. If I think about, for example, local planning, uh, when you have examples of local planning, uh, again, one of the things that I think people found irritating was the fact that you put an application for uh, most things to the district council, um, but they would actually have to consult the county council on a lot of aspects to do with the environment, to do with transport and so on. So now all of that, there's no buck passing effectively any longer. All of that's rolled together into, into one council with one responsibility. Um, we've got increased buying power. So that again relates again to the business community in terms of the fact that there's one council, which will mean that we can actually be uh, hopefully a simpler organization to deal with when we're buying services from uh, both national but also local business companies. Um, and we can work hopefully on behalf of business much more effectively across the region. Uh, instead of being on small geographies, we're able to collaborate with councils around us. So with Oxfordshire, with Berkshire, with Northamptonshire, with parts of West London and so on. Um, and it gives us the ability to work on a needs basis uh, with those particular councils. I think people will know that we're part of something called the Oxford to Cambridge Arc. Uh, so that stretches all the way, certainly from Oxfordshire at times, right down to Swindon, uh, across in a big swathe of territory as far as Cambridge and Cambridge is concerned. And that collaboration means that we can look at particularly some of the strategic infrastructure on a much more holistic basis as well. Uh, and obviously, when you come to West London, you've got the impact, particularly in the Thames Valley area um, of Heathrow um, and the impact. And maybe this is something we'll come back to about the proposed third runway at Heathrow, uh, but also what's happening in terms during COVID of the, um, the redundancies around things like British Airways and clear accountability. So, you know, there's one organisation that's responsible pretty well for everything. So you know who to come to, you know who to kick, quite frankly. So when did we launch? Well, we picked a really great date, didn't we? Um, we decided to go live on the 1st of April, 2020. We were due to have elections in May to create the new council itself. That council would elect its new leadership. Um, and what we'd had between then and now was the, an interim uh, structure effectively where all of the existing district councillors and county councillors were a shadow authority uh, and the uh, shadow executive comprised uh, representatives, as I've just said, from all of the different councils. We had our farewell parties for the individual councils, um, planning to launch on the 1st of April, but of course, COVID um, came slightly left field at us. It sort of grew in intensity from the end of 2019, gradually building up pace during the early months of 2020. Uh, and then really towards the end of February, beginning of March, we began to realise this was a major emergency to which we had to respond. Uh, and it really swamped and overwhelmed any thoughts of a, you know, a big fanfare launch of the new council because by then we were in lockdown. Um, so quite frankly, that, that was almost irrelevant. Quite frankly, we just segued straight into the new council. Um, and uh, the fact we'd done a lot of preparation before then really paid dividends. Uh, let me just see if I can uh, give you some examples of that as we go further through. The, the whole idea of having, you know, lots and lots of um, razzmatazzy style launch to the new council just disappeared entirely. Uh, we'd already made the decision right up front that what we would do is create the senior structure in place. Uh, there were people who said, look, just leave everything as it is, wait until May. Uh, the new elected council could decide how much integration they want. Uh, we rejected that. We said we'd have a completely integrated senior management structure from day one. That was absolutely the right decision to make. Uh, we appointed the new chief executive. We appointed the senior management team that reported to her. And indeed, what we call tier three, that's the next tier down. So all of the senior management structure was in place. And because we had that in place, when COVID broke as a really almost like a tidal wave sweeping across the UK, we were actually really well prepared we knew exactly you know, what that structure was. Everybody knew their jobs in the new organization. Uh, and actually what was quite interesting was it actually brought everybody together. Whereas before we'd had junior staff in five different organizations with a certain amount of tension, quite frankly, if I'm honest, still existing between them. Suddenly there was a common enemy, which was COVID. So we absolutely had to come together to fight that external threat, to do the very best we could for our local Buckinghamshire businesses and residents. And that gave us that, that common enemy to face out to. Uh, and, and it really brought us together. 
In fact, I met uh, uh, an officer who I know very well from one of our district council colleagues, and she actually said to me, and she'd be one of the most, uh, most negative, quite frankly, about the new unitary. And she actually said to me, I don't think I'd ever said this. I, I don't think I would ever have said this, but thank God we've got this new council because now we can actually really bring all the resources from districts and counties together uh, to face outward. And she was a real convert and she's been brilliant ever since. What we had to do because the government specified it was first of all, there was no election in May. So we had to accept the fact that we needed a structure politically to work to actually help effectively direct what we did as a council. So the existing shadow executive, the representatives from all the various councils quickly became the new cabinet for the new council. I've got the largest single cabinet in the country. Normally cabinets are a maximum of 10 people. I have 17, uh, which quite frankly is quite a challenge when you hold meetings, even online with Zoom or Teams. Uh, we also have a full council, which comprises all the existing district uh, and county councillors as well. So I've got a council of 202 um, that was set up. And that again is a gigantic body. Uh, when you think Birmingham has 101, you suddenly realize just how big this organization now is. Uh, we're actually very large in terms of our population. We've got something like 550,000 members of residents across the uh, across the council area. Uh, we collect something like 110,000 bins uh, every single day. Um, and forget that gritting 154,000 miles of road. Uh, it's about a tenth. It's about a, it's about 1,500. Uh, I've got a decimal point in the wrong place there. Uh, we've got 235,000 schools. We are a major employer as as an organisation. Um, and our website is really a go-to place for information for residents and businesses across the new geography. How did we respond to coronavirus? Um, given that we were a new council, we didn't effectively have a template. We quickly established uh, a structure. You're not meant to really read this. This is more like the London tube map, if you're not careful. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is some of the ways in which we had to reorganize the whole organization to face outwards. So we established uh, a effectively a senior leadership team that was based around the senior officers that had political oversight for each of the core cells that we established so just running down the right hand side of my screen if you can see that uh, we had effectively the crisis response management team which was myself and the chief executive and then we had a series of what we called cells um, so housing temporary accommodation looking at things like homelessness rough sleeping and so on trying to get people off the streets because they were very vulnerable there we looked at resources to make sure that we had the right IT in place, the right human resources and so on. Massive redeployment of our staff to face outwards. Uh, lots and lots of people who would otherwise be doing jobs like librarians and, one, uh, and so on, that they had to be redeployed very quickly into customer facing roles, supporting uh, particularly the shielded and the most vulnerable. Uh, children's social care and education. Obviously, one of the things that happened quite early was that schools were closed down, but we had to make sure that children who were now potentially locked in at home with parents, uh, we had to make sure that children's welfare was still maintained. So a big focus on that. Uh, we looked at mutual aid, working particularly with the private sector, but with the voluntary and community sector as well. So Bill Chappell looked after the, uh, the business community uh, and Gareth Williams linked in to the way in which we were going to work with voluntary and community groups. Uh, we worked very closely with the NHS uh, and if you remember back to the sort of March, April time, uh, you'll remember that actually the big focus then was on the NHS, making sure that it wasn't overwhelmed by the sheer numbers that were predicted in terms of potential victims of coronavirus. Uh, and so that relationship with the NHS has been really close and really mutually very supportive. Uh, and then rather sadly, we obviously also had to take preparations for what might be a really uh, intense period of uh, very high death toll and just working out how the logistics of that would work. That team worked very closely, not just in Buckinghamshire, but right across the Thames Valley, uh, and actually has proved to be really effective. Giving you some examples of, of how we stood up to try and support during coronavirus. One of the first questions we had is what role should we play? Uh, it would have been very easy to have actually said, you know, we can do everything. And we realized we couldn't do that. So one of the first things we focused on was providing what we call the community support hub. And that was effectively an enormous database, a go-to site for both residents and businesses where they could find information on just about any aspect of the support we were providing during this period. 
Uh, and that was a big building operation because obviously up until then, uh, we had the websites of five different councils and we really had to accelerate the way in which we built that single uh, community support hub for the new council. The other thing we had to establish was what role did we play locally? If you remember right back to the beginning of coronavirus, what started to happen very quickly was that local communities built their own networks. Sometimes it was based around a church or a faith hub. Sometimes it was based around an individual road, sometimes around individual villages. Uh, it, was, it, was very, it was very spontaneous. Um, and what we didn't want to do was step in and try and sort of squash all that by imposing some sort of central system on everything. So what we did instead was actually try and act as an honest broker, a sort of uh, intermediary in between all of that. So we put eight support hubs in place around the county geographically. Uh, and what we tried to do was be the go-to between, if you like, the, the structure for the council as a whole uh, and those local groups that were up in the running to make sure that we understood where they were. We could point people who needed support to them. And we could also find out where there might be gaps. So for example, there might be uh, a community group in one road but not one in the next road so we would know where that gap existed and we try and work with the local parishes and town councils to try and get those gaps filled as well focus very much on the most vulnerable uh, people who for one reason or another couldn't go out and who needed food delivered or for one reason or another needed other support uh, and we worked very closely with the voluntary and community sector uh, so example, uh, again on your screen, uh, Community Impact Bucks, uh, a really good and important partner for us. Um, matching volunteers with tasks that needed doing. Um, and also, for example, uh, we put out an appeal for volunteers, uh, rather like the national one that was done for the NHS. Uh, but we had something like 1800 people volunteer to come and help us deliver food parcels. Sometimes really simple stuff like just phoning up people particularly the elderly and being a voice to keep in contact with them, which was really important for people who were cut off from family and friends. And even down to simple stuff like collecting prescriptions from pharmacists or just walking somebody's dog. All of this really meant an awful lot to the people involved. I mentioned just now about the importance of health partners, and I know this is a business audience, but you'll have seen, if you remember the the intense focus on the NHS and, and more recently on the care homes. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there wasn't uh, the sort of overwhelming of the health service in Buckinghamshire that was being forecast, if you remember back to sort of the, the February, March period. So one of the things we did, and I think it's almost unique nationally, uh, is work with the local NHS to set up uh, what we, it's almost like the Nightingale Hospital that they built down in London, if you remember that at the Excel Centre. We set up a local version of that at the Olympic Lodge in Stoke Mandeville, uh, just near the, um, the centre there. So it was very closely located for the, hosp for the hospital itself. Uh, and we set up a 240 bed special social care facility for the most vulnerable. That meant we could keep people out of hospital, but who needed some intermediate care. And it also meant for people being discharged from hospital, there was somewhere for them to go um, if they couldn't go back to uh, their, their homes or to their care homes uh, immediately. It provided that buffer effectively uh, between the hospital service uh, and, and, the, and where people lived. Um, and that was really successful. In fact, it was so successful, uh, we actually have now just um, disbanded that because uh, its use came and went uh, during the peak of the period of uh, intense um, COVID activity, which goes back to about uh, April the 9th for probably about two weeks after that. That was the real peak of COVID. Um, and at the moment, we don't need this facility any longer. Some of the community initiatives, and one of the things I'm really proud on, uh, of is the way in which the community in Buckinghamshire has really rallied around um, their localities and indeed around the county as a whole. We've had some fantastic uh, support. Uh, lady in the top left hand side of my screen, uh, she actually works at Wexham Park Hospital, Karen, and she's been doing work actually uh, sewing um, gowns for the local hospital. Uh, we've got a community bus, we've got Bernie the bus, uh, just on the top right hand picture there. Uh, that's actually been sorted by uh, three local councillors up in the north of the county, uh, and they've been going around collecting food for food banks, uh, and they've helped keep some of the food banks going for those people who, quite frankly, a lot of people who've never used a food bank before, but have fallen on relatively hard times uh, during this period 
Uh, and so they're, they're not, not the usual food bank users, um, but it's been great to actually have that food there for them at time of need. Uh, and then just some varieties at the bottom of other people who rallied round, um, some people from Aylesbury Old Town, you see the caravan in the centre of your picture there, uh, and on the right hand side of my screen, uh, Arif Hussain, who's uh, one of the community leaders down in High Wycombe, uh, who again has been providing food again for some of the most vulnerable. Uh, and it's great again the way in which people have just rallied around to provide the support. Moving on to what you're probably most interested in, that's the business response. Uh, what became very clear quite early on was the importance of supporting local business. Uh, it, it was very obvious that with the lockdown that a lot of businesses were really going to struggle that actually people were being deprived effectively. If you're a retailer, you were deprived of your passing traffic, you couldn't operate effectively, business was, was closed down to you. Um, an awful lot of businesses that relied on um, being able to just you know, uh, obtain clients just weren't gonna be able to do that. So we wanted to make sure that as and when this emergency began to end, uh, that the businesses were still there, that we could actually support them. So that they could actually provide the jobs for local people um, and actually resurrect the economy. Something I'm always very well aware of is at the end of the day, it, it is private business that actually pays all the bills. So supporting local business has been a really big priority for us here in Buckinghamshire. One of the things we did as part of that map I put, I put up earlier um, of the way we organised was to have a specific business cell that focused on support for the business community. Uh, and we organised around Bucks Business First uh, and our local enterprise partnership to provide, if you like, a tripartite partnership there so that we coordinated support to the business community rather than having it sort of overlapping or duplicating, which was always, you know, potentially in some areas. So we used Bucks Business First as the front door uh, for advice and support to business. Uh, and that was really tooled up. We actually seconded a lot of staff from the new Buckinghamshire Council into BVF. Uh, they were a front line in terms of advising what government support was available. And the government has put out a whole series of initiatives, as I'm sure you're aware, um, over the last sort of two, three months. Uh, and they've come out in dribs and drabs. And it's been good that Bucks Business First has been there to, if you like, catch all those initiatives uh, and provide, if you like, a holistic or comprehensive front line uh, support for people wanting to know what's available. Uh, a whole host of different grants, obviously some cash flows, some grants, some loans and so on. Uh, we've also been using them uh, along with the LEP as the way of analysing the local impact. Uh, and I've got some information which again I can share with you in terms of the impact on the local economy, uh, the number of people who've been furloughed, um, the number of businesses um, that effectively have shut down for a period of time um, and also uh, what's likely to happen in terms of things like uh, those businesses starting up again. Uh, they've also been used as one of the inputs into central government. So when central government wants to know what's going on around the country, it comes to uh, people like the Local Enterprise Partnership um, and BBF has been providing the feedback to the LEP uh, and from the LEP into central government. And that's helping to develop some of the national strategy about the way in which government is going to hopefully um, help the country stand back up and business stand back up after uh, after COVID. Uh, we've run a series of business grants. Uh, again, you'll be aware, hopefully, of the local business grant scheme that uh, has been run. Government made available £91 million for that. Uh, we've paid out now just over uh, 70, well, nearly £77 million. Um, and actually that number of 5868 is slightly out of date now. It's, it's just over 5,900 businesses who benefited from the, the grant scheme that we've run. Um, it's been bound by the rules of central government. Uh, and I've had a number of people contact me, you know, actually a lot of businesses have contacted me who are almost exceptions uh, to that government scheme. Uh, and I'm really sorry, but, you know, quite frankly, I can't overrule effectively the professional officers who are abiding by those rules. So one of the things we wanted to do and we push quite hard on government is to have a more discretionary grant that we can actually have slightly different rules to uh, and we can support more businesses with. And yesterday um, that was confirmed. And today I've been uh, I've been promoting that on, on Twitter and other social media that we now have a specific uh, discretionary grant scheme. Uh, that's £4.5 million pounds, uh, and that's out there now, again, targeted very much at small businesses, 
So if you haven't been eligible for the, the previous schemes, uh, have a look at the BBF website because that's now out there. Uh, it's a requirement that you've had no previous support from any other scheme. And it's really aimed at people who've got a high fixed cost, a high property related cost. It might be to do with your rent or utility bills or broadband or whatever. Um, but we're trying to support um, those businesses who haven't benefited to date. It's only four and a half million pounds, which is the maximum that we're allowed by government to spend. Uh, but we'd like to make that go as far as possible. There's also a LEP scheme that was announced also yesterday by complete coincidence, uh, and that's called the Bucks Recovery Investment Fund. There's several million pounds for that, and that's on a 25% match funding basis. So about 75% of that can be granted from the LEP, um, and the other 25% has to be provided by the business itself. And again, there's a, there's a series of, of conditions for that. But I'd encourage anyone who's interested in that to again, visit the BBF website that has information both on the new recovery investment fund from the LEP um, and also on the new discretionary fund that the council has launched. We have a question in from Richard. Uh, Martin, I think you may have already sort of touched on it through uh, the current slide. Uh, Richard Renton, an estimated 710,000 owner managed of limited small businesses in the UK are not eligible for self-employed income support small business rate schemes or small business grant funds. Bucks is made up of many small owned micro businesses who work from shared offices or home offices. A large number of these made salary sacrifices to manage cash flow as legacy work dwindles. Most like ours has about three months operating capital until our finances dry up. What can you do to help support these vital business units? Bounce back loans are not the answer. Yeah, hi. Um to be honest, the, the, the sound quality wasn't too good, but I think I picked up uh, the issue of micro businesses that have things like shared offices and so on. Um, and the discretionary uh, scheme that we launched yesterday really is targeted at those sort of businesses. So if you've got shared offices, maybe you're in an industrial park or an incubator unit or something like that or a science park. Um, this is something that's aimed at you. Um, some examples might be, for example, market traders, um, people who run um, bed and breakfasts, uh, where they pay council tax but not business rates, um, some charities. Um, some may occupy property where they have a rateable value uh, uh, rather, than paying council uh, rather than paying business rates. Uh, there's a whole series of um, areas where we can help with discretionary fund. Uh, but again, it won't, I have to be honest with you, it won't cover everybody. Uh, you know, we can't save every business in the county because from my experience, judging by the letters I've received, there's always somebody who says, yes, but I don't quite qualify because. Um, so it's really difficult to actually have something that helps everybody. Uh, and the money is limited, 4.5 million, even at the sort of level of grants we're talking about, which is up to 10,000 pounds. That won't go very far given the number of businesses in the county. But my advice to, uh, I, I think you said it was Richard who, who'd written in with that question. Richard, um, go online, go to the Bucks Business First website uh, and check out what support is now available uh, and get advice from them. If I just finish off, because I'm quite close to the end of this now and uh, I'm happy to take any more questions from people. Um, trying to move down. Oops, there we go. Um, communications, I won't dwell on this. I mean, one of the things that was really clear early on was the importance of communications. Uh, we're a big new council. Uh, everybody had their own little way of doing it. A lot of the districts had magazines and things like that. They became inappropriate. They were just too slow in the timescale that we had. Uh, but we were allowed by the government to access a lot of separate databases, which we wouldn't be allowed to do in normal times. That meant we could actually put together a distribution list of nearly 200,000 residents. We emailed them twice a week during the height of COVID, um, and we're now doing it once a week to provide them with really important, relevant, up-to-date information. And that's had a tremendous amount of positive feedback, absolutely overwhelming. I mean, it's been fantastic to see, uh, and I'm delighted we've been able to do that. The shame is we won't be able to carry on doing that once the emergency is over. Uh, we've also done regular updates to town and parish councils. At the height of it, I did a daily update to members. Um, and I also used to do a, a video blog as well, uh, which uh, amongst other things um, included briefings for local businesses and so on as relevant. So communication, I think, was one of the things 
I think we did really well. But again, people on the line may be able to give me some feedback on how well they think we did. Bucks Business First, as I said just now, was our front door in terms of uh, communication with the business community. So just some themes really moving ahead. I mean, one of the things I'm very conscious of is that we are now moving out of, if you like, the, the main crisis period. We're moving very much into recovery phase. So how do we handle that? Uh, we've made a decision that we're going to do it on a place basis. Uh, because we have both the council and the NHS and the LEP and a lot of the voluntary and community sector all coterminous around the county geography, it's really easy to actually, uh, to actually uh, bring everything together. So you know, we can do that. We have a weekly call with all five of our Bucks MPs. So we're closely linked in with what they're doing. That links us into national government as well. Um, and I do a weekly call uh, that includes quite often Simon Clark from the, uh, um, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Some of the key areas that are coming up in all the calls is, first of all, the dire state, quite frankly, that retail could be in as we, we restart. Uh, it's been closed down now for a significant period of time. We know a lot of people have got used to online shopping. So how do we actually help retail stand back up? Because in many ways, retail is the heart of lots of our local economies, and we really want to be there to support them. So that's one of the key issues for us. Uh, and we're doing a lot of work now on social distancing as some of the big town centres like High Wycombe uh, and Aylesbury stand back up to make sure that people feel comfortable and safe going back into our town centres. Uh, we're looking at things like um, what does the impact of COVID and the way in which people have been in lockdown mean for mobility and commuting. People have stopped commuting into London in large numbers. So as things stand back up, will they commute back again in the sort of numbers that they have up until now? Or will we see much more of use of Zoom and Teams and other means of remote working? Uh, and what does that mean in terms of property? Because there's an awful lot of offices and commercial property around Buckinghamshire. Uh, and is that going to have the same demand as before? Or are we going to see a situation now where effectively property becomes in many ways superfluous to a lot of businesses? You know, it's much more important to have people working productively from home. And one of the bits of feedback I get very regularly from companies I talk to is actually uh, the productivity of their, their employees has actually held up really well working from home. And in some cases has actually been higher uh, than when they've been going into offices. Uh, there's a big focus also on decarbonisation, the whole carbon chain, uh, carbon agenda. Um, we've seen roads cleaner, quite frankly, air more pure than we've seen them probably in 20, 30, 40 years. You know, the government would really like to see that maintained. So there's a big focus on what they're calling active travel. Uh, but is that going to hold up? You know, is that is that going to be maintained or will we see the volume of cars build back up to what it was before? And what does that mean for investment, for example, in new road infrastructure? Or should we be promoting more cycle routes? Uh, there's some really big, interesting uh, social challenges, I think, in some of these questions as well. Uh, and I think something I touched on earlier, which really worries me a lot, is we've always been regarded as a very prosperous area in Buckinghamshire, very, very low unemployment rates. Uh, but we're seeing really big structural, structural unemployment in some of the, the big employment areas so Heathrow Airport laying off lots of people from British Airways, uh, Heathrow Limited itself actually laying off a lot of their own staff, that's the, the airport company. Uh, we're seeing big redundancies from EasyJet based out of Luton. Um, and a lot of retailers are saying to me, yeah, we're gonna reopen, but we're only gonna reopen with about half the staff that we used to have. So will they ever take back on those other 50% of their staff? Or are they gonna permanently downsize their staff because of the, reduced business actually that they can take with the uh, the requirement for social uh, distancing within their shops. Some really interesting challenges there but really significant for local people. Um, just take us on maybe to uh, the role of the LEP. I've mentioned the LEP repeatedly as I've gone through this presentation because they are pivotal to us in the way that we operate with the business community both in the short term uh, but one of the things we're very focused on working with them on is what does this mean for the medium and long term? Government has focused, that's Bayes, um, uh, the business uh, economy, uh, energy um, department. Uh, they've, they've been commissioning the LEP to look at the local industrial strategies that were developed. 
but to now modify those to become industrial and recovery strategies. So we're looking in there about where do we need to be investing in for the medium and longer term to rebuild the economy in the county. So it's not so much short term action. This is looking at where, if you like, we need to be investing into the, the, the medium and longer term uh, to bring back up the, uh, the growth in the economy in Buckinghamshire. Uh, lastly, um, some final challenges that we faced. Well, obviously, you've got to move forward in terms of the unitary reorganisation. I said at the very beginning of this that we'd reorganise the top three tiers of management. Uh, most of our staff are still operating as if they were in the old district and county organisations. They know to whom they report, they know the teams they're part of, but we've still got lots of people doing things in different ways, different computer systems and so on. We need to start integrating all of that together. We need to look at the financial, financial stability, both of the council and the economy across Buckinghamshire. Uh, we're very aware that our financial situation has been impacted very negatively. We've spent an awful lot of money. We've lost an awful lot of income. Uh, that's really hitting us very hard indeed. Uh, and we've been paying out a lot of money, particularly to people like the care homes and so on. Uh, we know also the economy in Buckinghamshire is going to be taking quite a big hit, we think, certainly for the next probably 18 months, two years. In local planning, um, we have to develop a single local plan. One of my points at the beginning about one of the advantages of the new council was to have a single, uh, single council responsible for planning. Uh, and looking ahead, we have to develop now a single local plan for the whole council area. Uh, certainly we want to have that in place by 2025. There's immense pressure for house building. The government sees house building as one of the ways out of recession. It wants to stimulate the economy through house building. And that has a knock on in terms of um, the, whole, um, uh, the, the whole industry that supplies to both the house building industry, but to people when they move into houses and so on. Town centre regeneration, I touched on retail and the, the pressure on retail. What we don't want to see is just boarded up dead high streets. We really have to try and find a mechanism and a, and a, and a feature about our town centres that makes them lively go to places again. And that's probably going to mean not just recreating the retail of the 1980s, 1990s and so on, uh, but making them something substantially different. And then we've got major infrastructure projects such as Heathrow expansion, whether that carries on or not. East West Rail, which runs between Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, the Oxford and Cambridge Arc, which has a much wider footprint. Uh, HS2, of course, still carving diagonally across the county and the big impact that's having. And then the big unknown, which I think everybody's talked about for many, many years now. Uh, what's the impact of Brexit? What sort of deal will be done? Will there be a deal done? Will it be a no deal? Um, and what's that going to mean in terms of the impact on local businesses across Buckinghamshire? So some really big issues there for us all to face as we go forward into the next couple of years, I think. So um, that's a run through. Um, I'm sorry, it's been a lot of information um, and it's taken me about 40 minutes to get through a lot of that. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions and hopefully you found that useful. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, any questions, feel free to uh, type it in the chat. Um, I've got a couple of comments rather than questions uh, as a follow-up from Richard. Um, he mentioned he wants to see, or would like to see some significant investment into the green economy, but also especially around the high street, it'd be good to see reduced retail licensing regulation, plus perhaps also free parking for at least the first few hours together with high street reward schemes to improve consumer confidence. I don't know whether you want to elaborate on that further or perhaps you can take it up. With yeah, what I've done, um, what, what's interesting is in the new cabinet, I've actually got one member, a guy called Steve Bowles, who's actually responsible for uh, effectively town centre regeneration. Uh, and that's both short term and medium term. So in the short term, it's a question really of how we help our town centres stand back up. Uh, and some of that will be focused clearly around retail. Uh, we are actively looking at the issue of um, parking. I can't give a commitment on this now, so please don't rush away and you know, start tweeting this, but you know, I am looking at giving a period of, of free parking for certainly the first maybe two, three months uh, to encourage people to come back to the high street and shop. Uh, and it's a real unknown to me, quite frankly, is there a pent up demand to get back out shopping? Or are we gonna see the high streets deserted as everybody's got used to using you know, online shopping, Amazon Prime and so on. Judging by the amount of cardboard I see at the sides of the roads, I think people have taken to online shopping big time. Uh, and I just don't know, um, I just don't know how the high street um, will fare when it starts to reopen. Um, that's, that's a big thing there. I think in the medium term, as I've said, I think we just need to start rethinking the high street. I think there'll be too many shops, 
for the amount of demand uh, and we'll be looking at how we can repurpose a lot of the old high street areas uh, whether it's around leisure whether it's around culture um, or, or even back to residential which is what a lot of those areas were historically Wonderful, thank you. Um, any more questions? If not, I've got a, a couple of, sort of specific ones. Uh, you mentioned Heathrow expansion. Um, what is the council doing to sort of throw its weight behind the expansion, if any? Well, as you know, we were one of the few councils that actually came out and supported expansion, uh, which was quite controversial, candidly. Uh, and we took a view was that, quite frankly, so much um, employment was generated by Heathrow in the Buckinghamshire area, particularly in the south of the county, but actually people living, you know, even around the Aylesbury and Northern area, are quite dependent on aviation. So we thought expansion was important. You know, I, I'm very well aware that in the aviation industry, uh, there is intense competition, particularly for interlining hubs. So whether it's Schiphol, Charles de Gaulle, or, you know, many of the, uh, the, 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 the Gulf um, states who are looking to take that sort of business away from the UK, so if you're flying from somewhere to somewhere, short haul to long haul or whatever, you need to be able to interline through a, a major international gateway. Uh, Heathrow needs to maintain that competitiveness. Uh, and likewise, if we're gonna have a global economy post-Brexit, you know, it's important that local businesses can actually get from uh, the Buckinghamshire area, the London area, um, to visit new potential um, markets around the world. So we took a quite, you know, quite, controversial decision to support Heathrow expansion. Uh, what happens going forward is anyone's guess, because obviously there's been that, that the legal uh, check on it at the moment. Uh, and then that was just before we went into the COVID lockdown. Wonderful, great, thank you. Um, no questions for me, anyone else got any questions, feel free to answer before you sort of move on. Um, I guess if anyone has any sort of specific queries, they can contact you directly. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sorry, it's been a sort of bit of a gamble through um, a lot of information. Quite frankly, there's just been so much going on um, in the last three months, and I've tried to cram that all into uh, a relatively short period on your your, your webinar. So uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to get some of that information out there to the business community. Uh, and if there's people watching who really would like to get more information on the way in which we've been supporting the business community, please use that BBF um, gateway, the website. Uh, and there's some great people there you can phone in, you can talk to, either web chat or alternatively talk to live on a phone uh, and they can give you the best information and the most up-to-date information. Wonderful, excellent. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, again, thank you very much, Martin and Buckinghamshire Council. Um, moving on as we slowly end, come to the end of this webinar. Upcoming webinars. Um, for those of you who are interested, the Thames Valley Chamber is still here for you. We're still running lots of online webinars, networking events. 5th of June, Friday, we've got one talking about Harnessing the power of social media with Visually Explained. 10th of June, we're talking about how to look and sound professional with Steve Kachik. 11th of June, we're looking at the international logistics and global supply chain issues for today and tomorrow. We've got both, thankfully and wonderfully, the both British Chamber of Commerce and Horizon International Limited. Skipping ahead on Wednesday, the 1st of June, for those who love their online networking, we are hosting a member online Thames Valley wide networking event. Again, details are on our website along with all the other webinars. And then finally, as we move on, spring survey. Um, as it says, every quarter we survey the Thames Valley's businesses community with results, results feeding directly into the British Chamber of Commerce quarterly economic survey. Um, it's one of Britain's biggest and longest running private business surveys um, and regularly receives more than 7,000 responses and for this reason, the survey is closely watched by policymakers such as Treasury, Bank of England, Office for Budget Responsibility, the EU Commission, and the IMF. So it's now more than ever important to have your voice heard. So feel through, go to our website, details on the top, fill out your survey, get your voice heard, um, and feed that information uh, to where it needs to go. Um, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Again, thank you very much to Martin for being kind enough to host and speak on this webinar. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so for those who want to listen back to it, can view it on our website and also our YouTube page. Um, and hopefully everyone stays safe and well. We look forward to seeing you all good soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.